Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming back to share your Thursday night with us for night two of HVAC 4000 Automotive HVAC Update. So on the first night, on Tuesday night, we discussed a lot of the changes that have happened to air conditioning systems since we have been transitioning from R134A to R1234 YF. We discussed a lot of the regulations that deal with R1234YF. Uh, we talked very heavily about leak detection. Tonight, we're going to go into system performance testing and we're gonna talk about temperature testing. And we're gonna talk about some of the new tools that have come out in the last few years that can very much help us with system performance and temperature testing. Uh, one question that we did get uh, after Tuesday night's class, was about cycle time when we are dealing with a 1234 YF vehicle. One of the most common complaints that we hear from technicians in the field is that it takes longer to do a recovery, evacuate, and recharge cycle with a 1234 YF machine than with a 134A machine. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Yes, the cycle time is longer. We have two th things incorporated into a 1234YF cycle as mandatory now that were not mandatory with a 134A cycle. We do have mandatory identification. Now, I don't consider identification a time add personally because you should be doing refrigerant identification on a 134A vehicle or an R12 vehicle as well. The only difference is now you physically have to. So the machine is going to take the time to do that. The other added time to the cycle is that we are requiring the vacuum decay leak test and the gross evaporator leak test with refrigerant. All told, the cycle takes somewhere between 20 to 25 minutes longer than with a uh, comparably specified uh, 134A machine. The reason being, as I said, we're adding physically the time for the leak test. The recovery cycle shouldn't take any longer if we're recovering a pound and a half R134A system with a J2788 machine, or we're covering a pound and a half 1234YF system with a uh, 2843 machine. It should take about the same amount of time because the recovery specifications are the same. The charge accuracy specifications are the same. So it should take about the same amount of time to charge. It should take about the same amount of time to evacuate as well. So all in, we're looking about 20 to 25 minutes longer cycle time for uh, 1234YF versus 134A. But that said, one of the things that I mentioned when we are doing that gross evaporator leak test. If you think back to what I said when we were doing electronic leak detection, you know, patience is key. And if you can have the volume on the leak detector up high enough or in a spot where you can hear the leak detector trigger, you don't have to stand there and watch that leak detector for 15 minutes. You can go do something else while you're listening and seeing if your leak detector triggers. So, you know, much of the cycle time, the machines are designed to be with a high level of automation. So you don't have to stand there and watch the machine do its thing, that you can go and do something else. So tonight we are going to start off with system performance testing. There we go. So what is a performance test? So performance test is basically we are taking the vehicle, looking at its current operating conditions. We are going to put the vehicle under a certain set of conditions, meaning we're going to control for whatever we can, meaning blower speed, doors open, doors closed, windows open, windows closed, what vent position, recirc door open, recirc door closed. Then we're going to factor in the ambient conditions, the things that we can't control. So ambient temperature, ambient pressure, uh, humidity, sun load, things like that. Put all of those together and evaluate the system based off of what the manufacturer says our minimum performance test is. 
system performance tests are vehicle specific. The manufacturers generally, you know, I'm not going to say all manufacturers because there are always exceptions to every rule, but most manufacturers, if you build a vehicle and service information under, uh, all data puts them under component tests or system tests, uh, there will be something listed for a performance test for the vehicle and will give you a certain way that the vehicle is to be set up and a acceptable table of results, meaning that under these conditions, ambient with the vehicle set up this way, my pressures should be in this range and my duct temperature should be lower than this. So why do we want to do a performance test? One, it gives us something concrete to compare system performance to. Yeah, a customer comes in and is complaining about poor HVAC system performance. What is good HVAC performance? It gives us something that we can quantify and say, sir or ma'am, based on the current vehicle's current operating conditions, yes, your system is functioning properly. No, your system is not functioning properly. And from there, we can either say your system is functioning properly, everything's working, you're good to go. Or we can say, no, your system is not functioning properly and we need to make some repairs. It gives us that baseline. Then after we make those repairs, we do the performance test again. And it gives us that opportunity to one, confirm our repairs, make sure the system now is functioning. And now you have something where you can go to the customer and say, okay, this is how your system functioned before we made the repair. This is how the system functions after we made the repair. We now have something tangible to show the customer to document that everything works. And when we're doing a performance test and we're operating the system, it gives us an opportunity to inspect the rest of the system. You know, do we have sufficient blower volume? You know, possible we have a cabin air filter or something that's blocked that could be hurting system performance. You know, a compressor that's hammering, you know, maybe getting ready to fail. You know, wind noises, things like that, where we can recommend a repair to the customer. So again, it goes back to you know, what is good HVAC performance? You know, what are we looking for? Are we solely looking at duct temperature? Are we looking at pressures? Yeah, you know, Bryn, in your opinion, what is good HVAC performance? Um, I think it's a loaded question, I know. Yeah, it's uh, dependent on the vehicle, I guess. But I don't know. I fairly consistent results in our area. But yeah. Definitely have yeah, to I mean, know what, what uh manufacturer's looking for. Right. You know, you, you tend to, when you do a lot of air conditioning, you get a feel for, yes, this is right. But there are system design differences that can yield different performance test results if you are not, if you're unsure of what you're looking at. One of the things that can make a huge difference is service port location. Yeah, service port location, high side port versus low uh, in the discharge line versus in the liquid line can make a huge difference in pressure. And we have some slides as we get towards the end uh, further on in the presentation that illustrate this. So we need to take a whole a big picture look at the system to figure out what is good HVAC performance. And then again, under what conditions? You know, if we've got a vehicle that's sitting you know, closed up in the sun with a black interior all day and we go out to do a performance test on it, that system's not going to cool really well for a while because we have so much heat built up in the cabin. So again, our performance test will specify, usually specify something to change the air, you know, open the doors, open the windows for a period of time, let all that super hot air out. We're looking at and comparing, as I said, our system performance, pressure and temperature under what our ambient conditions are. The ambient conditions are basically the biggest thing that we can't control when we are doing a system performance test. You know, we can't control what the outside temperature is. Uh, obviously, we, unless you have a climate controlled shop, you can't control the uh, humidity very well. Do we need to put a, a fan in front of the condenser for a performance test? You know, we're going to be sitting idle. Some manufacturers will specify in their performance test routine that they want a condenser or a fan blowing through the condenser to make sure that we have sufficient airflow to give good performance. You know, go back to 
uh, what we talked about. The condenser is job is to get rid of the heat that we transferred into the refrigerant from the passenger compartment. So if we don't have enough airflow to get rid of heat, to get heat out of the refrigerant, we now don't have the capacity to put heat into the refrigerant from the passenger compartment. Again, windows up or down. If we have windows open doing our performance test, it's going to change our heat load. And we have some slides coming up that will illustrate just how much having a window or a door can change the heat load on the system and affect your HVAC performance. You know, fan speed, duct position. You know, some manufacturers, uh, Toyota specifically, has some uh, an extra door inside the HVAC box where we can put different temperatures air in different positions. So what duct position, what fan speed does the manufacturer want? As well as, are we on outside air or uh, recirc? Again, this is why we say it is so important to use the manufacturer's specification. What you see on the right-hand side of the screen is the performance test specification for a uh, R134 AGM product taken out of the service manual. So GM wants the performance test done with the vehicle in the shade. So we're removing sun load. If you, know, you can't put the vehicle in the shop, pick a shady place, put an easy up over it, something to minimize the sun load on the vehicle. They want the windows open to allow that heat change. If the system was operating, let it sit, let it equalize for a period of time. Attach your gauges and thermometer. GM specifies using the ACR 2000 AC machine. Uh, a gauge set and thermometers works just fine. Record your ambient temperature and pressures. If we are within the range that we can start the test, meaning that you know, if we have static pressure in range of, yeah, there's refrigerant in this thing. Obviously, if our static pressure is below what the static pressure should be for our given temperature, that would indicate we have a system that's basically empty or almost empty. So we would not necessarily want to do a performance test under those conditions. We know what the results are going to be. At that point, GM says, close the doors and windows, open the driver's window six inches, and set the AC in these positions. It's giving us our blower speeds. They want recirc mode, dash outlets, max cold, all AC outlets open, and record pressure and temperature. This is a good one. You yep. guys don't think vehicles change, do you? <laughs> oh, vehicles never change, Brent. Every vehicle's been the same forever. Yeah. But let's look at how a vehicle reacts. Now, this, the, the Next couple of slides are scan data taken from a late model Chevy Colorado pickup truck. So here we have set the vehicle up as the manufacturer said to do a performance test. We've got the vehicle running. We're looking at what our evaporator core temperature is. So we have a 37 degree evaporator core. That's about as cold as we want an evaporator core to go any colder when we start running the risk of freezing. Vehicle is set up, max cold, compressor is running. This vehicle has an electronic variable displacement compressor. And we can see that given our current ambient conditions, we've got a cold evaporator core and a 70% command to the compressor control valve. That means we're using 70% of the compressor's displacement to cool the vehicle. So at this point in time, the vehicle isn't working real, real hard to give us a comfortable passenger compartment. You know, we're hitting a 37 degree evaporator core at 70% duty cycle. Think about this when we're looking at evaporator core temperature versus compressor control valve duty cycle. Think of it like fuel trims and we're looking at fuel control. Yeah, you know, How much fuel trim are we having to add or take away short term or long term to bring, make our oxygen sensor switch to give us good fuel control. We can do the same thing here. We're only taking 70% of our current capacity to give us a cold evaporator core under these conditions. Now look what happens. We opened the door six inches. That doesn't sound like a lot. 
But look at what it did to the heat load. So the vehicle starts to react. Our evaporator core temperature went up. The vehicle responds by increasing the compressor control valve duty cycle. And we can see that our high side pressure has increased, indicating that we are transferring more heat. Keep it running with the door open. We can see that our evaporator core temperature starts increasing, which makes sense. We're now putting more heat load on this vehicle. So we're putting hotter air through the evaporator core. It's going to warm the evaporator core. The vehicle tries to respond. We're at 98% compressor duty cycle. We only have 2% left to go. We're at critical, evapor uh, critical duty cycle here. We're running out of heat load out of what we can do to increase our cooling capacity. And we still haven't been able to bring that evaporator core temperature down. The evaporator core temperature is now 11 degrees warmer than it was with the system running at steady state. Two minutes, that's all this took from cracking the door open to this slide. We're at 100% compressor command. There is no more room for capacity. We're pumping as much refrigerant through this system as we currently can. And our evaporator temperature is up to 48 degrees. So an 11 degree increase, we're running. The system is now working as hard as we can and we can't cool that evaporator core down. All of that from opening a door six inches, and it only took two minutes. If this air conditioning system was an engine management system, right now we'd have a check engine light on and a lean code set because we used all of our fuel control and we can't bring that, make that oxygen sensor switch. We can't make that evaporator core as cold as we would like it to. Couple questions, Tim. Sure, Brent. Um, Nathan said he didn't catch it uh, where you would find the OE test procedures. So the OE test procedures, I use all data for my service information system. Um, I can't tell you where it is in Mitchell. I have the last time I used Mitchell, it was still on demand five. So I can't tell you where it is in pro demand in all data. If you click on HVAC system uh, in the list that pops up, you scroll down, uh, Sometimes it'll be listed under refrigerant and uh, then testing and inspection or on the right hand side of the screen scroll down to testing and inspection either under initial inspection or component tests generally in all data. Cool and there's another question in chat um, was this was this was it recirculation on in this case I don't I don't know that it matters I think the point is that we we're setting this vehicle up based off the manufacturers requirements for the performance test and just cracking the door you can see the results of that but my guess is probably was recirculation on yeah I, I know there's nothing in the notes about how this was set up uh, I didn't look at the uh, actual vehicle specifications I know it does say in the notes that this was set up per uh, manufacturer specs. I would assume the fact that we had an evaporator core temperature that cold, uh, it's almost impossible to do that on outside air. So I would think it would have had to have been in recirc when we started. Yeah, I think so. Richard Falco, I think, is the one that got that. So if he's with us, he can post that. Yep. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No. So let's look at, you know, one thing that we see with as vehicles become more and more complex and we're doing more and more things with them, we have a lot more data available. You know, it doesn't really matter what the system is. There's just a lot more that the control modules are looking at. This is a partial PID list for this vehicle. Like I said, this is a late model Colorado. Look at some of the things that we've got that we can see in our scan data. We have an air quality sensor built in to this vehicle. So we're looking at what the quality of the outside air is to see you know, if we have poor air quality outside, we probably want to be in recirc if, you know, trying to keep odors and bad things out of the interior passenger compartment. In days gone by, we had one in-car temperature sensor. Look at how many temperature sensors we have on this vehicle. So we have, uh, 
lower left duct, lower right duct, lower rear duct. We have ambient. We do have an a composite ink car temperature. Um, there's a temperature sensor in just about every duct if you look through more of this PID list. We have a humidity sensor built into the passenger compartment of the vehicle. Why might we want to have a passenger compartment humidity sensor, Bryn? Why would we want a passenger compartment, compartment humidity sensor? Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to do everything we can with less. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're looking at and saying, okay, under these conditions, goes along with the fact that we're measuring windshield temperature. So we're saying if we look at the humidity in the passenger compartment and say it's humid, we're running the risk of fogging the windshield based on inside humidity, outside humidity, and windshield temperature. So we're saying, okay, we might have conditions here that we could be fogging the windshield. We need to change how we're conditioning this air to make sure we don't fog the windshield. And the controller's doing that without the vehicle, without the driver really noticing in some cases. Also, same thing goes with sun load. You know, in days gone by, again, the you know, sun load sensor was, ah, that's a little bit of fine tuning. We don't really care about sun load sensor. It didn't have a whole lot of authority. Look at what we're measuring with sun load. We're physically measuring the intensity of the sun in watts per meter squared, but we're also looking at the elevation and azimuth. So we're looking at how that sun is coming through the windshield to see how we have to change how we are cooling the passenger compartment. There are always, always, at least on GM, some configuration that's available. Under certain conditions, you may have to do an HVAC actuator learn. On a lot of GM products, you have the option to do HVAC actuator learn either with the scan tool or with a uh, manual procedure that usually involves cycling power to the HVAC module, at which point it will learn automatically. I'm going to caution you to only learn the actuators when absolutely necessary, when directed to by uh, the service manual. You don't want to run into a condition where you know, exposing a problem that wasn't there before because you have an actuator that started to fail. This used to happen back in the days of the uh, NS Chrysler minivans, the 96 to 2000s. If you remember on those, uh, they had a cool down test and something else built into the HVAC. And if you were unlucky and you went to change battery in one, when you were finished, you would have flashing lights on the control head and you would have to do a cool down test in order to get the lights to go out. That was really fun as those vans got older and the customer didn't want to fix the leaking evaporator core and now the air conditioning doesn't work. So I can't run a cool down test but all I do is put a battery in the car and now I've got flashing lights. So you don't want to get into a situation like that if possible. So I would caution against learning actuators only when required or when told in service manual. The other thing that on a lot of GM products is configurable is afterblow. What afterblow is, if you're not familiar with it, is that after the vehicle is shut off for a period of time, generally about 15 to 20 minutes after shutoff. If the HVAC was run on the previous trip, we will turn the blower on for a short period of time in order to dry the evaporator core. Think about what that environment inside the HVAC box on a hot, humid summer day is like after we shut the, key, the HC off. We've taken an evaporator core that is nice and wet, covered in condensate and was cold. Now we're gonna make it really hot and wet. What's that a breeding ground for? Mold, funk. Mildew, funk, lots of bad things. So if we take and turn and force warm air over the evaporator core after the vehicle has been shut down when there's, excuse me, no one in it, we can dry that evaporator core out and prevent mold buildup and prevent all of that funk from being on the surface of the evaporator core. On GM, it is usually a programmable parameter in the uh, HVAC module. You can usually find it, uh, Autel, scan tools listed under special functions, uh, Tech 2 or MDI 2 usually have 
but under module setup or module configuration that you can turn after blow on or, on or off. GM is not unique as far as being a manufacturer that allows you to do this. Uh, Volvo has allowed it for a very, very long time. With Volvo, it is a uh, flash file in the HVAC control module. You can either put in the calibration without afterblow or the calibration with afterblow, depending on customer preference. With GM, it is really just as easy to configure this as pull it up and press a button. So something to be aware of. You know, if you replace an HVAC control module, you may have to configure the afterblow uh, to make sure that's set up the way that the vehicle was. Or if you get one that comes in, the customer's complaining about a smell after you clean the evaporator core, you could configure afterblow to keep it from happening again. So let's look at pressure testing and trying to understand what is going on. After we talk and go through pressure testing, look at what's going on inside the system, then we'll talk some about um, what's going on with temperature testing. So what are the questions that we're going to look at and what can we learn from asking all of these questions. So we have static pressure and static pressure is, you know, as the system is at rest, what are the pressure on the gauges? Does static pressure provide us any useful information? Thoughts, Bryn? Absolutely. I think uh, one thing that I didn't think about is potential like air in the system that could help with the static pressures. Too, yeah, but one, uh, beyond the obvious, obviously. Yeah, as Bryn said, if we have a very, very high static pressure, and by that I mean after the system has equalized, you know, if we're looking at high static pressure on both sides of the system, you know, if we have an expansion valve system that we've just shut off, it can take a while for the system to equalize. We have some slides showing that coming up. But if we have a elevated pressure on both sides compared to what we should statically, that is a good indication that we have either uh, some form of contamination, air contamination, uh, contaminated refrigerant or refrigerant with some different physical properties in it, or a significant overcharge possibly. Uh, again, you know, the first two, your refrigerant identifier would pick up if we had air contamination or if we had uh, contaminated refrigerant. System overcharge uh, would become more obvious as we started to run the vehicle. Any time that we are looking at pressures and temperatures, we need to consider what state the refrigerant is in. We'll get into states of refrigerant here a little bit. When I say what state is the refrigerant in, I don't mean is that refrigerant in Pennsylvania or Florida. It doesn't operate differently depending on what physical state it's in. We're talking about the state of the refrigerant, solid, liquid, or gas. Looking at pressures can indicate restrictions. Uh, Generally, when we're looking for a restriction, we want to couple pressure and temperature. We'll again talk about that as we go on. Looking at pressures can also indicate a mechanical concern. Obviously, if we've got the system running, the compressor engaged, and our high side and our low side pressures are equal, we've got something going on with the compressor. Either if we have a fixed displacement compressor, we most likely have a failed compressor. If we have a variable displacement compressor, especially an electronic variable displacement compressor, we may have a problem, something going on on the control side. Uh, possibly if we have something not that the solenoid is not being turned on. So mechan uh, fixed displacement compressor versus variable displacement, we can have some extra steps in testing here. We also need to think about where heat comes from. The idea that we have to ha keep straight in our heads whenever we are doing air conditioning, when we are doing testing, and it can be a hard concept for people to grasp, is that there is no such thing as cold. Cold is merely an absence of heat. And the name of the game is to take that heat 
that's inside the passenger compartment and move it someplace else. We don't want it in the passenger compartment. But heat is energy. Law of conservation of energy, one of the fundamental laws of physics is that we energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. So how do we transfer it? And where is this heat coming from? We talked about some of where the heat is coming from. Yes, sun load is a big factor on the heat inside a passenger compartment. The air temperature, obviously, if it's 100 degrees outside, there's more heat in the air than if it's 80 degrees. So we have more heat that we need to remove. Remember, sitting just on the other side of the firewall from where we are and underneath our feet are two very, very hot things. We have a running engine and we have an exhaust system. So we're going to get some radiant heat into the passenger compartment from them. Now, granted, we have heat shielding and insulation and things like that that should keep much of that heat out of the passenger compartment, but you're always going to have some heat transfer there. And the occupants themselves, you know, you get into your car at the end of the day, you know, it's a hot summer day, you've been working all day in a shop that doesn't have air conditioning, you're hot. All of that heat, our bodies are giant radiators. We sit in the car and we're giving off transferring that heat into the car. Now, how do we transfer heat? There's three means of heat transfer. Convection, which is heat transfer by air movement. So think about like a convection oven. The difference between a regular oven and a convection oven is the blower fan that circulates that heat, which makes food quick faster. Conduction, physical heat transfer by touching. I have my hand that's 98 degrees sitting on a tabletop that's probably between 75 and 80 degrees. My hand is transferring heat to this tabletop. If you use a thermal imaging camera, you can see the heat that my hand transferred to the tabletop through conduction. And then radiation, you know, we give off heat just sitting here without air, without phys uh, physical contact. So when we talk about the state of the refrigerant, we're talking about at the given point in the system, we need to think about, is the refrigerant a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Now, refrigerant should never be a solid. Uh, off the top of my head, I want to say the freeze point of 134A is somewhere like negative 100 degrees. Uh, I could be wrong on that. That's just off the top of my head. So basically we're concerning ourselves with at this point in the system, at this point in the refrigeration cycle, is it a liquid or is it a gas? And we need to think about how we change states. You know, what do we do when we want to go from a liquid to a gas? We add heat. What do we do to go from a gas back to a liquid? We take away that heat. When we add heat, and when we talk about heat, there's two different kinds of heat, sensible heat and latent heat. The sensible heat is the heat that we can feel. You know, Bryn, can you feel the difference between a 60 degree object and a 120 degree object? Yes. Absolutely you can, that's sensible heat. Can you feel the difference between 32 degree ice and 32 degree water. I know they're in Florida. Both. I'm in Florida. I'm not, I don't, I'm not familiar with 32 degree water, <laughs> but no, I'm sure. 32 <laughs> degree water is what you get you know, when you uh, throw that uh, water in the freezer just before it starts to make ice that you have something to put into your uh, pina colada or whatever you guys drink down there on hot days. <laughs> But, you know, 32 degree ice, 32 degree water, they're both 32 degrees. Right. You know, I can stick a thermometer in them, they're both going to say the same thing. But there has to be a difference. To raise water from the freeze point, 32 degrees, so we've taken that water that started as ice, we've put heat in it, it's now all liquid, it's 32 degree water. We start adding heat to it its temperature starts increasing. This is sensible heat. 
in the U.S. system or in the standard units of measure, heat is measured in a unit called British thermal units. It takes one British thermal unit to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. So to go from 32 degree Fahrenheit water, water that's ice that's just melted, so 32 degrees, to 212 degree water, basically water that is just ready to turn into steam. It takes 180 British thermal units. We can measure this, we can feel it. It is sensible heat. But to go from 212 degree water to 212 degree steam, something's gotta happen. We have to put more energy in. But we can't measure that temperature change. So it's not sensible, it's what's called latent heat. So latent heat is the amount of heat that you put into an object or into a fluid to make it change state. There are two different kinds of latent heat and the latent heat is a property of the physical substance. We have latent heat of fusion, which is the amount of heat that you would put into an object to go from a solid to a liquid or you would remove from that substance then to go back from a liquid to a solid. Latent heat of vaporization is what we deal with in air conditioning. The latent heat of vaporization is the amount of heat that you have to put into a unit of matter to change it from a liquid to a gas or then remove from that to change it from a gas back to a liquid. For water, to take one pound of water from 212 degree water to 212 degree steam, it takes 970 British thermal units. So think about that. We didn't change the temperature of this water one degree, not one measly degree, and it took that much energy. As it was just water, we put 180 therm British thermal units in to change 180 degrees. To take that same quantity of water then and change it from water all to steam, it took five and a half times as much energy to go from 212 degree water to 212 degree steam as it did to go from 32 degree water to 212 degree water. That's a lot of energy. And this is exactly what is going on in the air conditioner. As we go around the loop in an air conditioning system, we start, we're going to start at the compressor. Refrigerant leaves the compressor as a high pressure, high temperature vapor. When refrigerant enters the compressor, we're adding work. Energy, uh, we talk about energy transfer in our conditioning system as work or energy. We transfer energy out at the condenser, we transfer energy in at the evaporator, and we transfer work in, yeah, the work that comes from, that the engine puts into that compressor to turn it at the compressor. The sum of the energy put in in the evaporator core and the energy, the work put in at the compressor has to equal the energy that we take out at the condenser. So again, that goes to show we are just moving heat at this point. Everything that we put in from the passenger compartment here goes out here. So we leave the compressor as high pressure, high temperature vapor. That refrigerant vapor is full of heat. We call it at this point, saturated vapor. We then pass through the discharge line, through the condenser. At the condenser, we have the fan blowing over the condenser core, transferring heat out. 
we've removed that superheat. What that superheat means, what I mean by superheat, is it's heat above the boiling point. So we are high pressure, high temperature vapor. We take that heat out as we pass through the condenser. We leave the condenser now as a hot, high pressure, high temperature liquid. This is now considered a subcooled liquid. What I mean by subcooling is now we have a temperature below the boiling point. So we've taken heat out of the refrigerant to lower its temperature to the boiling point, and then we've pulled all of that latent heat out. And then we've lowered it some more once we've gone below the boiling point. On an expansion valve system, we're going to pass through a receiver dryer, maybe part of the condenser, maybe standalone, and then we will go through the expansion device. The expansion device is pictured right here. What happens when we allowed something to expand? We have a pressure drop and a temperature drop. At that point, as we go through the expansion device, that high pressure, high temperature liquid becomes a low pressure, low temperature liquid. We enter the evaporator core now as a cold liquid. As heat transfers into that refrigerant, that refrigerant boils. We leave the evaporator core, now still cold, but as a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. We boiled all of that refrigerant and transferred heat into it. What happens if we don't leave the evaporator core as a vapor? If we still leave as a subcooled liquid, Bryn? What's that? What happens if, so I said that the refrigerant and the evaporator core has to boil. We leave the evaporator core as a superheated vapor. It's cold refrigerant, but it's refrigerant that has picked up a lot of heat and it's looking for some place to go with it. What happens in the system if we don't transfer enough heat into it and the refrigerant leaves the evaporator core as a liquid? Well, I guess you could risk damaging the compressor. That's it's called the compressor goes bang. Yeah. Think about it. We can't compress a liquid. So we have to leave the evaporator core as a vapor. On an orifice tube system, orifice tube systems are called flooded evaporator systems because we don't leave the evaporator core on an orifice tube system as a vapor. We leave as the liquid. We then have to go through an accumulator where that refrigerant finally boils. So we leave here as refrigerant that's just ready to start boiling and it finally boils inside the accumulator. Because of that, because we aren't transferring in as much heat as we possibly can, we're leaving heat in the passenger compartment, we're picking up that last bit of heat from the engine compartment, orifice tube systems are horribly inefficient. That's why manufacturers have gone away from them. Manufacturers went to them in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s because they're cheap. You know, a piece of plastic with a piece of brass in it to the meter refrigerant through the system and an accumulator was cheaper than an expansion valve. The trade-off was efficiency. When we had R12 systems that held four pounds of refrigerant, efficiency wasn't a big deal. Now we've got smaller and smaller systems. We need the efficiency, which is why we've gone so far to expansion valves. But we leave the evaporator core then as a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor, looking to go back to the compressor where we put work in and the cycle starts again. So the state of the refrigerant at any point in the system between the compressor and the condenser in the discharge line the state of the refrigerant is a high pressure, high temperature vapor between the condenser and the expansion device. It is a high pressure, high temperature liquid from the expansion device to the evaporator core. 
It is a cold, low pressure, low temperature liquid. In the suction line between the evaporator core and the compressor, it is a cold, low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. We often hear people talk about, well, the pressure temperature chart says that at this temperature, my pressure should be this. This is called the saturation pressure and temperature, meaning this is the point where the refrigerant is boiling. So this is the point pressure temperature relationship where liquid and vapor exist at the same time. There are two places in the air conditioning system where this chart holds true, where your pressure and your temperature would follow this chart. And that's going to be somewhere here in the middle of the condenser when we are physically changing from a vapor to a liquid and somewhere here in the evaporator core when we are changing from a liquid back to a vapor. What we're going to be looking at when we say something is superheated, that means that for a given pressure, our temperature should be above what the pressure is on the pressure or above the temperature on the PT chart. When we're in a subcooled state, we should have a temperature below what the PT chart says. Hey, Tim. Yeah, Brent. We got a, a pretty relevant question for right now. Um, okay. Can you explain a little better, or I shouldn't say better, um, again, or um, maybe another way about what superheat and subcooling? Sure. So let me go back here a couple of slides. Let me go back to here. Um, actually, uh, I'm going to stop screen share for a bit because I'm going to jump to another point in the presentation. If we're going to get to I, it later. We're going to get to it, but I do, I want to have it straight in everyone's head when we get to that point. So let me jump forward here and then I'll come back to where we were. I think this is helpful. Um, it can be a little bit. Um, I agree. Yeah, this is a hard, a tough concept to grasp yeah. um, for some background on this. This is college level thermodynamics stuff that we're learning, that we're talking about right now. I mean, this is stuff that I learned um, during my college engineering class. So, um, we're on the I mean, screen. for me, for, for those of you that have been working on ACs a long time, really haven't gotten into the, uh, the abstract you know, physics behind everything, but, but you will agree that, you know, the in condenser to the outlet condenser, it's not a massive temperature change. You're talking 30 to 50 degrees. And on the evaporator, you know, we taught to kind of back in the day to kind of check the charge level by checking the inlet and the outlet of the evaporator, which can be still true to this day, depending on the system you're using there, we're only looking for a few degrees change. So it's kind of interesting to think, well, how, you know, we're, we're supposed to be cooling off the cabin but we're really not changing the temperature very much so that's kind of where this conversation kind of can kind of help that my uh computer just started acting strange here as i tried to change this apologize for the uh, technical difficulty here guys let's see here oh, there's the chat are you seeing an enthalpy chart up right now, yes. Bren? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So, the what I want to talk about here, yeah, we're going to see this slide again as we go on. But what happens here when we say something is subcooled? So, what this chart looks like looks big and scary. We'll get into it a little bit more later but we have a set of pressure and temperature relationships where for this given pressure and temperature, the refrigerant is a liquid. 
that means it is subcooled. That means that for this set of pressure and temperature relationships, it is below the point that it would boil. So we're when we say something is subcooled, we are automatically talking about a liquid. Then we move into a reason when the refrigerant is boiling in the middle here, we're in what's called the two phase region, which means that we have liquid and vapor existing simultaneously. As we add more pressure and temperature, we have a set of uh, relationships where for this given pressure and temperature, the refrigerant is a vapor and it has more heat, more temperature than the boiling point. At that point, it is called superheated. So often you know, in air conditioning, when we refer to something as subcooled, that means that it's a liquid and it has capacity to pick up heat. When we say something is superheated, that means that it is a vapor and it may or may not have the capacity to pick up more heat. It's at that point, basically it's vapor that's looking for somewhere to give off heat to go back to a liquid. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that uh, last statement is definitely helpful. Okay. Uh, back my meeting controls here. So we were back, yeah, the key breakaway that was, then that was a very, very good question. The key takeaway here is the concept of sensible heat versus latent heat, meaning heat that we can feel versus heat that we can't feel. You know, as I said, it goes to reason that there has to be a difference in, temp in energy between a liquid and a gas, even if the temperature is the same. That concept, that quantity is the latent heat. Temperature is a measure of the intensity of that heat energy. Heat, as I said, it is a quantity. We do not make cold. We talk about an absence of heat. So when we have something, we take heat away from it. And we say that it's cold. No, it's not cold. The only thing time that we can truly say something is cold is at absolute zero, which is the temperature where there physically is no heat energy left. So what we're doing is we are taking that heat, we're picking it up, and we are moving it to someplace else. That's why we call the evaporator core and the condenser a heat exchanger. We're in the evaporator core, we are taking that heat and exchanging it from the air to the refrigerant. Then at the condenser, we're exchanging it again. We're moving that heat from the refrigerant to the outside air. Show of hands, is, does that make sense to anyone? If, if you need more clarification, please raise your hand and or you know, drop us a question and we'll uh, try to clarify it. I feel like you told them to raise their hand if it made sense or it didn't. So you wanna <laughs> clarify that? <laughs> if, yeah, if it didn't make sense, if you'd like some more explanation, please raise your hand and we'll do what, what we can. Uh, we got a uh, couple hands raised. Let's see. All right. Yeah, if, if you have something you want to drop it in chat or drop it into question, I'll answer questions now. I think we're good. I'm not seeing much activity. H blocks have superheat values to ensure that the Refrigerant has fully changed state to a gas. That's from Jim Kokonis. Yes, correct. As Jim said, so I was going to get into expansion valves a little bit later on. But one of the things I said with an orifice tube system, we do not, we leave the evaporator core as liquid. And then that final boiling takes place in an accumulator. On an expansion valve type system, we don't have an accumulator. So the job of the orifice tube 
solely is to spray liquid refrigerant into the evaporator core. It doesn't care how much liquid is there. It just sprays liquid and keeps going. The accumulator worries about whether we're vapor or not when we go back to the compressor. An expansion valve doesn't quite have that luxury. The expansion valve has to make sure that when all of that refrigerant leaves the evaporator core, it is vapor. As I said, if it doesn't do that and the evaporator floods, if we have enough liquid getting back to the compressor, we run the risk of hydrolocking the compressor and putting the connecting rods through the cylinder walls. We don't want to do that. So part of, if you look at uh, an expansion valve, uh, I have a cutaway valve somewhere in my teaching there. I had a cutaway valve before TSA took it from me. Um, there is a sensing bulb in the suction side in the evaporator outlet that we're measuring the evaporator core temperature, the temperature of the refrigerant coming out, I should say, versus the temperature on the back side of the expansion valve. The temperature difference across the evaporator core is the superheat. So part of the program, the calibration of the valve is to maintain that temperature difference across the evaporator core. We cool there? Yeah, I don't see any, uh, any new questions or any conversation okay. chat. Yeah. Like I said, guys, I know that this is complex stuff to understand. This is college level thermodynamics. But I think when you understand this, um, this is what makes air conditioning make sense. As you said, with static pressure, we're looking, you know, based on once the system has equalized, our static pressure should fall in line with the pressure temperature chart. Why? Because sitting in that system, that system is now, for all intents and purposes, sitting static, the same as that cylinder of refrigerant that's sitting on the floor. So our pressure and temperature relationship from the PT chart would hold. So if we took and said, you know, it's 72 degrees in the shop and we took that system, shut it off, let it sit for a period of time, our pressures should equalize to what the PT chart says. So in this case, we look at the PT chart for 72 degrees we should see a static pressure of about 75 PSI. And we see that our high side has come to that very quickly after we shut the system off. The gauges that are shown in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, these are off of a Hyundai. Uh, this is a few minutes after the system was shut off. So the high side came down very quickly, but our low side has not yet started to rise. Our low side pressure is only about 45 PSI. Now, in the old days, we were often taught that, you know, a system should equalize within a few minutes of uh, the system being shut off. That if the system didn't equalize within a few minutes of being shut off, that we were to start looking for a restriction or a bad expansion valve or something like that. You think about an orifice tube where we have, you know, that fixed orifice that never closes, those systems equalize within less than a minute of shutting down. That simply isn't always the case. Yeah, this vehicle, this Hyundai, be, by the design of the system, the design of the expansion valve, it takes several hours for the system to equalize. We let it sit till the next morning and it did equalize and sat overnight. It took about four hours for the system to equalize. So beware of that. Just watching your static pressures and seeing what happens when the system equalizes or how long it takes for the system to equalize is not always a good test of do I have a restriction somewhere in the system. Um, does relative humidity play a role on this, on static testing like this? Does relative humidity play a role in static pressure? On these now, readings is what the question was. I'm assuming by these readings, we mean uh, pressure readings, static pressure as the system is sitting. Right. Uh, at that so. point, no, because we're not transferring heat. Uh, we're not actively transferring heat into the system. Um, 
temp relative humidity doesn't uh, particularly affect this. It can take the vehicle as it's operating some time to stabilize as well, especially a vehicle with an electronic variable displacement compressor. This is a capture of the scan data from that same Hyundai. Uh, this is a late model Hyundai. I believe this was a 14 or a 15, if I remember correctly. Uh, and what we see happening, and this is normal operation for this vehicle. As the vehicle starts to run, as the system starts cooling, and we're trying to figure out where in the operating range everything needs to be. You know, what duty cycle do we need for the fans? What duty cycle do we need for the compressor to give us optimal cooling, the you know, most efficient cooling? And what we see happening here is the PCM starts turning the compressor duty cycle up. Our pressure starts increasing. So our fan pulse width starts increasing. Fan pulse width starts increasing, pressure starts dropping. So the pressure drops, now the fan turns off. So the pressure starts going back up, fan turns on, pressure drops, fan turns off. And the system will do this for several minutes, playing around with both compressor duty cycle and fan speed until eventually it finds its groove and everything will settle in. And we see at steady state here, our high side pressure dropped into a groove and our fan dropped into a groove. Now this was you know, 170 PSI high side. I don't have an evaporator temperature number, but I can tell you this was not a particularly hot day. The ambient temperature uh, when this was taken was about 75 degrees. So this is normal low fan speed, not real high, high side pressure for a day where we had minimal cooling load. But this is perfectly normal. It's something that you might see. You know, this is normal operation. This is not a broken vehicle. And here we see the pressures and what we had going on while the system was starting to stabilize. Once it stabilized, we came in at a very stable run of pressures. We can see our high side was only moving about seven PSI and our low side only moved one PSI. So we settled into a stable mode of operation. You do see that there is a difference between the PCM measured high side pressure at 170 PSI and what the we see on the gauge set. I mentioned that you may see this as part of understanding uh, what's going on in the system. Our high side fitting service port is in a different part of the system than our pressure transducer is. Our high side fitting on this particular vehicle is in the discharge line. So we're at compressor outlet, condenser inlet. Our pressure transducer is in the liquid line. So we're seeing running about a 30 PSI difference between high side pressure and pressure transducer. Again, that's normal. You will see a difference in pressure between the high side in the discharge line and the high side in the liquid line. So again, that's part of why we say going back to manufacturer specifications for performance test is going to take that into account. You know, that if this vehicle's in the low side, my high, or if this vehicle's high side fitting is in the liquid line instead of the discharge line, my pressures on the performance test specifications will generally be lower. I think is interesting, and I'm sure you're going to get into it, but what's cool is for diagnostic reasons, you know, if you suspect maybe there's a restriction in the condenser and your service port is, you know, on one side or the other, like let's say discharge, maybe your service port's on the discharge uh, or your service port's on the liquid line and maybe your pressure transducer is on the discharge or vice versa, you can compare them and kind of get better, you know, to kind of give you more evidence of maybe whether or not you do have a restriction I can answer. I think that's yep. absolutely neat. that's that's a great thing to look at. I wish personally, because we only get two service fittings, I would like to see a service fitting in on each side of every component personally, because that we could see what our pressure is on each side of every component. That's never gonna happen. So I like it as Bryn said, when we have the pressure transducer is not in the same line as 
the service port so that we can see what's going on in different spots. You know, you get to something where you say, oh, both are in the liquid line. Well, that's great, but I think I got a blocked condenser. I'd really like to see what my actual discharge pressure is. So, you know, being able to see the pressure at all the different spots in the system is a great thing when we're trying to do diagnosis. Let's look at another example here. This is a uh, 2010 Toyota Tacoma plain Jane TXV air conditioning system. It's a Delphi compressor, clutched, no electronic variable displacement. Ambient temperature is not particularly warm. You know, it's a, uh, about a spring day. We're under a light heat load condition and we see the system cycling. The tool that's being used here is a uh, manifold gauge set that Yellow Jacket sells. It is more geared towards or positioned towards uh, home and commercial HVAC than automotive, but doesn't mean it has to be. And what we see here, the graphs, the tool is plotting the pressure as the system cycles. So we see pressure drop, compressor comes on, low side pressure comes down, evaporator temperature comes down, we get to our cutoff point, pressure goes up, starts to come back down as the compressor kicks in from there. This gauge set will also, based on ambient temperature and the pressure in the system, give you a saturation temperature. So it's telling us that our saturation temperature for the high side at 177 PSI should be 122 degrees, and for the low side should be 26.9 degrees. So if we had the temperature probes hooked up, which you can see the fact that it's blocked out here, we don't have temperature probes hooked up, but if we had the temperature probes hooked up and attached to uh, various points in the system, as we'll see later, it would calculate the superheat and the subcooling, basically tell us how far above the boiling point we are in the uh, evaporator outlet and how far below the boiling point we are at the condenser outlet. What do you think happened here, Bryn? You can see these, we have, looking at the timestamp, two minutes of difference between uh, the last picture and this picture. And we can see that at this point now, our pressures are elevated. We have an over 20 PSI higher high side. Low side is slightly elevated. But more importantly, we can see at this point, the system is no longer cycling. Thoughts on what happened here? If you guys have any thoughts on what happened, put them into uh, the chat box quick. So this is the... This is the same Toyota Tacoma. So it's a nothing fancy system, cycling clutch, expansion valve, we're cycling off of evaporator temperature. And uh, something just changed. Maybe we restricted the airflow or crossed the condenser. That's a very, very good thought. And that is actually exactly what happened. So what this illustrates is that we've now taken away some of our ability to remove heat. And we see that now that heat is being is stuck in the refrigerant. So we're not cycling because our evaporator isn't getting cold anymore. We're not, and we've our high side pressure is elevated because we have more heat in the refrigerant. Does it make sense to everyone? That's a key concept to think about. The high side pressure comes from heat. That's why you know, when we have an airflow issue across the condenser, we see elevated high side because we can't get rid of heat. Always also, you know, take into account when you're doing, you know, if you've got a vehicle running for a long period of time, outside effects that can change your AC system performance. Example, you know, if we had this vehicle running for a long period of time 
and the engine temperature starts to increase. The engine temperature starts to increase. We're going to see fan speed increase, which could change our high side, which is what you see in this picture. If you are lacking a performance test specification, I said it is possible that you will be lacking a performance test specification. This is a rule of thumb for fixed displacement vehicles. This is in the book, uh, once you guys get it. The thing that I find interesting here, we normally talk about humidity increasing the heat load on the vehicle. And that's not always the case. You look here at 85 to 95 degrees, and you can see this chart is broken down. The second column is relative humidity. And we see 85 to 95 degrees, as our humidity increases, we would expect our pressures and our duct temperature to increase. That makes sense. We increase the heat load. You know, hot, humid air is harder to cool. Below 85 degrees, if we look at it, we see significantly lower high side pressure expected. Our duct temperature is going to be higher, but what's happening is all of that extra moisture in the air is helping to remove heat energy at the condenser up until about 85 degrees. Past 85 degrees, that humidity starts to hurt us transferring heat at the condenser, which is why we see our high side start to elevate. So what can we tell from looking at pressures? What are some common causes of some of the things we might see looking at pressures. We've got what we'll call normal pressures, which on a hot day, if we're looking at true compressor discharge, systems working hard, idling in the bay, windows down, 30 and 290 is not out of the realm of possibility on a hot day, looking at pressure in the discharge line. Everything normal and it's not cooling, start to look for problems back on the other side of the firewall. You know, do we have a blend door problem, uh, mechanical problem inside the HVAC box, uh, control system problem, things like that. Low side and high side both low. The obvious cause is low refrigerant charge. And that's probably the most common cause of seeing something like this. The other possibility is if we have a stuck closed expansion valve, and what's happened here at this point, the expansion valve is stuck closed. The compressor has pulled all of the refrigerant out of the evaporator core and out of the suction line, which is why our low side pressure is almost to a vacuum. We've pushed all of that into the condenser and discharge line and liquid line, but it doesn't have any heat in it, which is why we don't see an elevated high side. This is not a very common way for an expansion valve to fail, but it does happen. Uh, one of my buddies just had an expansion valve fail like this on a 2009 Infinity FX35, um, and it had him scratching his head for a little while till he called me. So it can happen. This can happen in the real world. Low side and high side both elevated. Air in the system is a very common cause of this. And again, your refrigerant identifier is going to uh, notify you of that. Refrigerant overcharge is a possibility, you know, especially if someone decided, yeah, my air conditioning doesn't work, so I'm going to go get that Via Pro in a can stuff and try to fix my air conditioner. Very possible that you'll wind up with pressure readings that look like this. Oil overcharge. Oil overcharge can look like this because now we can't, what happens when we have an oil overcharge is we start coating the inside surfaces of the heat exchangers with oil 
and now we can't get heat out. Uh, no airflow through the condenser, again, we can't get heat out. The moral of the story when we have elevated pressure and on both sides of the system is that we're not getting rid of heat. Low side high and high side low, most likely an internal compressor failure, possibly a variable displacement compressor, either mechanically stuck on low displacement or electronically on an electronic variable displacement compressor being put on low displacement. So again, if we have an electronic variable displacement at this point and we have something going on like this, we're gonna need to test and see what command we have going to the compressor control valve and see, is that command logical? You know, if I've got a 100% command to the compressor and I see this, I've got either a failed solenoid or a failed compressor. If I have a 20%, for instance, duty cycle to the compressor and I see this, that's what I would expect for a 20% duty cycle. Now I need to go figure out why I only have a 20% duty cycle. Do I have an input problem? Do I have a controller that's gone brain dead, something like that going on? And make sure that you actually have a symptom. Like, you know, if, you're, if you see these pressure readings on late model cars that are just super efficient, if your AC is performing okay and you just are freaked out by these pressures, you might not have a problem, something to consider. Brennan's 100% right about that. You know, don't go chasing yourself down a rabbit hole if the system is physically working. We'll see a little bit of that as we go here. Uh, I'm going to pick up speed going through the next segment because we are running out of time and there's a lot of inf uh, very good information I want to get through in the next segment. But the moral of the story is that alarming high side pressure can have multiple causes. But the moral of the story, anytime we see elevated high side pressure, is that it's because we aren't getting rid of heat. Heat is what generates pressure. The flip side of this and what brings the whole picture together is when we add temperature testing into pressure testing. The setup of the vehicle is a little bit different to start doing temperature testing. With the performance test, what we said is we're setting the vehicle up as the OEM says, and we are establishing system performance against the known baseline. When we're doing temperature testing, we're gonna give the, this vehicle the worst case scenario, make it work as hard as it possibly can and see what it's doing. So how are we setting this vehicle up? If we're gonna do temperature testing, what we're doing is we're evaluating how well we can put heat into the system in the evaporator and how well we can get rid of heat at the condenser. So we're going for worst case scenario. Engine at idle, meaning we have the least amount of refrigerant flowing through the system. Doors open, windows open, give this thing the most heat load it can possibly get. Park it out in the sun if you can. Get this thing hot. Set the AC on max cold blower high so that we have as much air as possible going through the evaporator core. We're trying to stress this system. This is the air conditioning version of taking the system, strapping it on a treadmill and making it run for an hour while we watch its blood pressure. This is a stress test. And we're going to see what happens. Doing that, we need to measure some temperatures. We need to measure the temperature drop or temperature change across the condenser. We need to at least measure the evaporator outlet and if possible, the evaporator inlet. We also wanna measure ambient temperature and duct temperature to see how well we can, we are cooling, how far below ambient that we are getting. What we're looking for here, now this is, I'm going to caution you that this is for a vehicle with a non-subcooling condenser. Most modern vehicles have basically an extra part put into the condenser that is called a subcooler at the bottom. It is to take physically more heat out of the refrigerant than we would with a traditional condenser. On a subcooling condenser, it's not uncommon to have 
70, 80 degrees of temperature drop across the condenser. Again, that goes with the standpoint of if I've got a high temperature drop across the condenser, but I don't have a symptom to go with it, I'm not going to chase it. Generally, what we're going to see if we have a restricted condenser giving us high temperature drop is we're going to see an elevated discharge pressure to go with it. Across the evaporator corner, and we have noted here that this is for an orifice tube system. The reason that we say this is for an orifice tube system is because you generally can't get to the back side of an expansion valve. If you can get to the back side of the expansion valve on a liquid line, we would see similar results. So on an orifice tube system, we want to see uh, less than five degrees of temperature difference across the evaporator core either way. If, it's an ex if we're dealing with an expansion valve system, as I said, we usually can't get to the backside of a valve, so we could neglect uh, measuring the evaporator temperature. Only looking at the outlet temperature doesn't do us a lot of good without looking at the inlet as well. And we want to see a duct temperature at least 30 degrees lower than ambient at the center duct. Here's some results from a normal system. So it's a 90 degree day. Uh, I believe this was taken off of a Crown Vic, if I remember correctly, or a Mercury Grand Marquis, one of the two. 90 degree ambient temperature, worst case possible conditions, 55 degree center duct temperature. So that's a 35 degree change. That's better from 35 is more than 30. We have an acceptable duct temperature. Condenser inlets 140 degrees, condenser outlets 107. 33 degree change across the condenser. 33 is between 20 and 50, we're good. Evaporator inlet is 36 degrees, evaporator outlet's 33 degrees, three degree change, we're good. 27 PSI low side, 230 PSI high side. This system is working normally. If we have excessive temperature drop across the condenser, it can be indicative of a few things. Either physically a restriction. Yeah, if we have no refrigerant going through, if we don't have sufficient refrigerant flowing through, it makes sense that the refrigerant that does get through is gonna be a lot cooler. Coupled with we've got that refrigerant that's sitting in the discharge line trying to come through the condenser is just getting packed with heat and work. So generally we would see that high temperature drop coupled with excessive high side pressure. High temperature drop without excessive high side pressure would be indicative of an undercharged system. You know, if we don't have enough refrigerant circulating through, again, we aren't picking up heat, we're not putting as much heat into the system, fan blowing across the condenser, pulling heat out, and we're really subcooling that refrigerant as it goes through the condenser less than 20 degree drop across the condenser, system overcharged. Physically, we're trying to pull heat out of it. We have so much refrigerant and so much heat there that we don't have enough capacity to take the superheat out. We can't take that latent heat out to get it back to a liquid. Condenser fins plugged, something, anything that's affecting the airflow across the condenser. Again, we can't get the heat out because of something happening in the condenser area. Uh, real quick, Tim, if you were, if you had a service port uh, on the liquid side between the condenser and the evaporator and you had a restriction in the condenser, what, uh, what would you expect to see there? Obviously, if you have a service port between the compressor and the condenser, you'd have elevated pressures and you'd also see, um, you know, excessive a temperature drop across the condenser. I just want to make sure the technicians really understand that they have to pay attention to where their service ports are. When right. So if we have no service port, you know, ideally, hopefully, if our service port is in the liquid line, we would hope that we had a pressure transducer in the discharge line, but that is not always the case. In the absence of a... Uh, uh, so what's my train of thought? Transducer. In the absence of a transducer or a service port and discharge line, what we would see if we had a restricted condenser 
we would see a obviously a very high temperature drop across the condenser coupled with the fact that that discharge line would be burn your hand hot so it's going to be hot we're going to see a big temperature difference and we're going to see a lower than what we would expect high side pressure in the liquid line for the most part. The only thing, if I was missing a uh, service port or a pressure transducer in the discharge line, I would probably recover the charge and measure my charge just to make sure that I wasn't dealing with an undercharge condition. But if you have a you know, burner hand hot discharge line with a high temperature drop across the condenser, you most likely have a blocked condenser. Very cool. Thank you. Yep. Now, if you want to be 100% sure, there are these tools, uh, it's called a saddle valve, that you can put onto a line, just clamps over, and then you run a tool through to pierce the line, and it creates a pressure tap. I would not leave a saddle valve on a vehicle, but if you want to be 100% sure, you could put a saddle valve in. But if you do that, plan on replacing the line as well. Um, evaporator. Now, as we said, these rules were going to restrict to an orifice tube system because we can measure true evaporator temperature on an orifice tube system for the most part. Outlet is more than five degrees warmer than the inlet pipe. System undercharged. Again, we don't have enough refrigerant, so the heat that we're putting through the evaporator core is putting enough heat into the refrigerant that we're physically warming it. We're superheating it further than we should. Excessive oil, because we aren't transferring heat effectively, or a block tube. More than five degrees cooler, uh, possible that you would see a system that from a system overcharge. Depending on how overcharged the system is, uh, you can overcharge the system. It will start to cool, uh, have a colder evaporator outlet than inlet to a point, at which point we overcome the condenser's ability to remove heat and the temperature starts increasing. Or possibly the orifice tube not sealing and flooding the uh, evaporator core. Ambient to duct temperature less than 30 degrees, obviously a low charge. That would be coupled with some of the other things that we've seen. If we have normal system performance, looking at our temperatures under the hood, and we don't have uh, sufficient cooling in the passenger compartment, now we're looking at controls, you know, faulty blend door, things like that. Uh, most of the other possible causes of duct temperature less than 30 degrees below ambient uh, would be caught someplace else in the temperature test. To tie this all together, a great way to tie this whole all thing together and to physically see, give you a visual representation of what's going on in this system is the pressure enthalpy chart. Now, I know this chart looks very, very scary. This is a true engineering tool. But why we like this chart is because we have constant pressure on one side. Now, note that this is in PSI A, absolute pressure. So absolute pressure is 15 PSI higher than gauge pressure, technically 14.7, but 15 for round numbers is close enough for us. Our gauges say zero at atmosphere. Absolute pressure takes into account atmospheric pressure as well. So the pressure on this chart is going to be 15 PSI higher than what your gauges say. The enthalpy part of this chart, we're going to ignore. We're not doing any enthalpy calculations. If we start to break this chart down into uh, its fundamentals, it becomes less daunting and we can start to see what's going on. So we have a line that's drawn on the chart. Everything to the left of this line, we have liquid. We have subcooled liquid. Saturation, this line is called the saturation line. Saturation is the point at which we become a pure liquid 
or a pure vapor. So anytime we are subcooled, we can consider that a saturated liquid. Anytime we are superheated, we consider that a saturated vapor because it is a pure vapor or a pure liquid. On this side of the chart, there is no vapor left. On this side of the chart, there is no liquid left. The point at the top here, we have the critical point is the point at which we move from liquid to vapor. Anything that's in the middle of this part, we call the two-phase region. That is the point at which vapor and liquid exist together. We add in these crazy shaped lines. You can see on this side of the chart, they come straight down. They hit the line, come straight over, and start going down again. These are lines of constant temperature. So we come down straight across, and what you see here is that when we have liquid and vapor existing together, pressure and temperature is fixed. These lines, the pressure and temperature relationships in this region is what we see on the PT chart. And then again, they come over here to where we are, a vapor. We have uh, lines of entropy, which again, we're not going to talk about. If we throw it all together, there is one more thing that is not illustrated here that I want to go back to this chart. It's a little bit hard to see looking here, but you see these numbers here, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and this one, the 0.4, has a quality next to it. What these lines going through this chart tell you through the two-phase region is there are lines of quality, meaning how much of the refrigerant at that point is a vapor. So at this point, if we have a quality of 0.1, that means that 10% of the refrigerant at this point is vapor. 20% all the way increasing till we hit this edge where we saturate and we have 100% vapor at that point. So if you pull, when we start to plot on this chart, you can see how much uh, vapor and liquid we have at any given point. So we put it all together and we get a full pH diagram. Now we can use this as a tool. We can start to plot our pressure and temperature relationships that we measured during our temperature testing on this chart. And we can see what's happening in the system. So if we plot this is our condenser outlet pressure and temperature. So the temperature we measure at the outlet of the condenser with our high side pressure. Here we plot our low side pressure and our evaporator outlet temperature. We can draw some lines. If we draw a line straight over from that line intersecting there, find an intersection point. This point is the pressure and temperature at the condenser inlet. We can also plot it to make that intersection point. If we draw a line straight over and a line straight down, that gives us our evaporator inlet pressure and temperature. A system that is working correctly should look very close to this picture. We should see that our refrigerant leaving the evaporator should be just barely superheated. So we go through the compressor, we're going to pick up superheat, we lose all that superheat in the condenser, leave the condenser as just barely subcooled refrigerant liquid through our expansion device into the evaporator core where we pick up heat. That is how an air conditioning system works on paper. And that is what an ideal system looks like when we plot the pressure and temperature relationships. Now, why is this helpful? 
because we know that an ideal system should look about like this when it's working properly. If we plot these pressures and temperatures and it's not working properly, it can help us to figure out why. And there are some tools that can help us with this. So first for, temp for performance testing and for measuring our duct temperatures, we have a tool from CPS that will measure your outside temperature versus duct temperature and help you to perform a performance test. I'm going to skip through this a little bit quickly, but it will tell you how to do a performance test and give you a printout of is our performance where it should be to give to the uh, customer. In order to accurately do temperature testing, we need a way to accurately measure temperature. What we need when we do temperature testing, we need to be using contact thermocouples to give us an accurate temperature. We can't do accurate temperature testing with an infrared temperature gun. The reason why is uh, infrared temperature guns depend on the infrared radiation coming back to the temp gun to calculate temperature. Things that are black absorb infrared radiation. Things that are silver reflect all infrared radiation. Bryn, what color are most air conditioning system components? Silver and black. Silver and black. <laughs> so we have the two worst colors used to do any kind of infrared temperature testing. The other thing is it can be very, very hard if you're using an IR gun or a thermal imaging camera to physically see and make sure you're hitting the right component. You know, if I'm working on a truck, say like a Ford F-250 with the evaporator core under the hood, if I'm trying to measure that evaporator outlet temperature with a temp gun, what's to say that when I went to try to hit that liquid line or that uh, suction line, that I didn't miss and hit the exhaust manifold that's sitting right next to it? Or how about my heat watch from the exhaust manifold over the line? So we need to be using wired yeah, or physical contact thermocouples. Uh, this tool from CPS is a four channel uh, temperature tester so we can measure temperature at four different places at any given time and it can do some calculations for us. So we can say, I want the difference between uh, thermocouples A and B, say I have A on my condenser inlet and B on my condenser outlet, it will do the math for me about what the temperature difference is. And we can use this to do a manual performance test. Uh, there is nothing wrong with using a good old plain Jane thermometer. These are plenty accurate for duct temperature. Um, electronic, mechanical, you may have to calibrate a thermometer periodically. Uh, the easiest way to calibrate it is take a glass of ice water. If you have ice and water at equilibrium, that's 32 degrees. So if I have a glass of ice water here, the ice has melted, so this is warmer than 32 degrees. But if I had ice sitting in that glass for a period of time with the water, I would know that's 32 degrees and my thermometer should be about 32 degrees. Uh, most mechanical thermometers can be adjusted slightly. Electronic thermometers and electronic thermocouples rarely need to be calibrated, but we will advise you if you're going to use an electronic thermometer, keep a spare battery handy. Uh, these do tend to get bumped in your toolbox and can get turned on when you don't want them to. And a lot of them aren't normal size batteries that we would keep in a shop. So you don't want to go try to do something and have a thermometer die on you in the middle of testing. Cool tool that came out that really does a nice job with temperature testing is the man tooth kit from Yellow Jacket. This tool set has actually been adopted by several OEMs as a required essential service tool because of what it can do. We have two pressure transducers. The tool set comes with adapters for R134A and R1234YF. We can use it on both refrigerants and it comes with a set of temperature clamps. Each temperature clamp one clamp connects to one pressure transducer. 
you then connect the pressure transducer via Bluetooth to a tablet or smartphone or what have you to do your testing. And there's an app that you download from Blue from uh, Yellow Jackets uh, in the App Store. The only thing I do not like about this kit is I don't like the clamps. Uh, I find that sometimes they're a little bit big. They can be a little bit hard to put places sometimes. Other than that, you know, it's that's personal preference. The kit works very, very well. This is a great tool, especially for when you have a vehicle that exhibits a problem only going down the road because I can secure everything under the hood. I can set my cell phone with the app up in a cup holder or something that I can see what's going on. It beats the old days of taping a set of gauges to the windshield and going for a drive and hoping that we don't have a summer shower while I have gauges taped to the windshield. By the way, this is not 12344 YF, <laughs> the slide before. Uh, I missed that, but no, was, yep. 134A, 1234YF. So we said this is an app. You're going to select uh, your session, pair the transducers, assign it which transducer is on the high side, which one is on the low side. The temperature clamp comes with the transducer. Once you have locations assigned, then the tool will start recording. And we can see in this example, we have high and low side pressure. The tool is telling us what our saturation temperatures are. And we can see that we have a very, very superheated low side and a very, very subcooled high side. So the tool is doing the math for us and telling us what's going on. How you would set this up to do calculations Yellow Jacket says to take your high side clamp and put it as close to the expansion valve in the liquid line as possible. You're going to then take your low side clamp and you want to put it as close to the compressor as possible. I will caution you, as I said, these clamps are a little bit big, so make sure that you have sufficient clearance. You know, in this case, you can see we're getting down towards a belt drive and we're getting towards a cooling fan with this uh, low side clamp. So you may need to pick an alternate location. You always want to clamp these to the aluminum tubes. Uh, you get a much, much better reading with the aluminum tubes than if you clamp to rubber hose. This tool is capable of drawing out that enthalpy chart for us. If you click on the button at the bottom with enthalpy, we can make the tool generate this chart. And what we see here looking at that pressure, remember I said that if the system is working normally, this line from evaporator outlet to condenser inlet should be very, very close to our saturation line. It's way out in right field at this point. So we have a very, very high amount of superheat being picked up in the evaporator core. But we have a good amount, and we have a lot of subcooling going on as well. This indicates that we have low charge or high charge. We have a charge problem. In this case, we had a system that was supposed to be 1.15 pounds that was at 1.34 pounds. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. That's about four ounces of overcharge. That is almost 20% of the system capacity. The system is not cooling at this point because it is overcharged. Again, this was likely a case of there was a problem somewhere Vehicle owner saw the commercial on TV, got a can of Be a Pro in a can, and thought he could fix his own air conditioner. We recovered, charged correctly, and we can see we are much closer. It's still a little bit high, and part of the reason for that 
also on this particular vehicle, this is a late model vehicle that has an inline heat exchanger in the uh, that we looked saw on Tuesday night between the liquid line and the um, suction line. So what we're seeing in the superheat calculation and in the subcooling calculation, because of where we put our temperature probes, we're seeing the superheat that's transferred picked up in the inline heat exchanger, and we are seeing the subcooling again that's picked up in the inline heat exchanger. If we put the temperature probes on the other side, basically moved our liquid probe from the firewall back closer to the condenser and moved our suction closer to the firewall, we wouldn't see that, but at this point in time, we'd be looking at an incomplete picture. So this is normal. Yeah, a little bit further out is normal for a vehicle with an inline heat exchanger. We have much improved duct temperature over uh, when we started. So we said this is another example of how the service ports matter. What we see in this picture is a uh, late model, I believe this is a GM product. We have the pressure transducer and the uh, high side service port are in the same line. And we see that our pressure transducer is within four tenths of a PSI of what we are reading with a gauge. That makes perfect sense. Let's look at a vehicle where they are not in the same line. This uh, Chrysler product has the uh, service port and the pressure transducer in different lines. Key on engine off, we see our high side pressure is very close. Our pressure transducer is about 102 PSI. We're measuring 104 with the gauge. We start the engine, let it run. We see our pressure transducer is 189 PSI and our gauge is 178. This is a case of we have our pressure transducer in the discharge line and our service port in the liquid line. So again, this just goes to show that it does matter where the service port is and where you take your high side reading. As Bryn said, if we don't have a customer complaint on a newer vehicle as efficient as things have gotten, we can see some things that may look strange to us. This is a 2019 Ford Ranger under a low heat load condition. It's a very cool day. We can see we, we have an electronic variable displacement compressor and a very efficient system. We only have a 93 pound high side, but we can see we have a very, very good amount of subcooling and minimal superheat indicating that the system is working efficiently. What we've done is because we have a low cooling demand, we have throttled back the compressor to match the load the cooling load uh, or the compressor displacement and the capacity of the system to the cooling load. Many vehicles are do starting to do this now, especially when you get into a situation where you move the blend door off of full cold. For years, air, automotive HVAC systems have always been partial reheat systems, meaning that we cool the air first through the evaporator core, dehumidify it, and then we warm it back up if we want warmer air. Well, that's wasteful. Why cool it just to heat it back up? With an electronic variable displacement compressor, we can say, okay, we don't need that full cooling load. So instead of having to heat it back up, let's just not make it as cold. So we'll see more of this when we're operating our systems under low cooling load conditions. Uh, we have one more example. Ken has just popped on, uh, which notifies me that I am running out of time. Um, I have one more example that I would like to cover. Um, we'll leave it up to the class. I mean, yep. raise your hands if you want to stick by a little over time and do this case example and then the Q and A. It raise looks like everyone wants to do the, uh, this example to me. 
Okay, well, then let's go ahead. All right, let's go ahead and do this one. So this was a 2014 Subaru. What we see here is we did an analysis with the Mantooth, and we are seeing that we have a lot of superheat on this side. We have a low system at this point. We're seeing a massive, massive temperature drop across the condenser. We're seeing our condenser outlet over here is somewhere around 90 degrees. Our inlet is about 150. So we see a 60 degree drop across the condenser with a warm evaporator outlet. So you can see our evaporator outlet temperature here is almost 60 degrees. Doing this analysis and looking at what we've got going on here with high superheat, big temperature drop, not much subcooling going on, we have a system that is low on charge. And we can figure that out before we recover the refrigerant. You can see 45 degree drop across the condenser, which is not normal for this vehicle. This is not a vehicle that has a subcooling condenser in it. One of the things we talked about last time was the fact that you now have to change the filters on your machine on a uh, 2843 or uh, 1234YF machine every 150 pounds of refrigerant. So whereas in the past, we might just recover the refrigerant to see if we had a full charge. Now it would be best if we didn't recover it, if we fit to figure out that we have a charge. In addition to the extra time that it's going to take you to recover and then charge the vehicle again. So as I said, we see we had about a 45 degree drop across the condenser. We have now with a full charge in this system, we can see the difference. See how that line on the right hand side has moved much closer to the saturation point. And we can see that our condenser outlet temperature is much higher, though we have more subcooling in the condenser. So we have much less superheat coming out of the evaporator, more subcooling on the condenser, higher condenser outlet temperature, lower condenser inlet temperature. This is what a fully charged functioning system should look like. This is about as textbook perfect as an uh, plotting a system on an enthalpy chart looks. As we saw, we lowered the charge. We see something that looks more like that. Charge correct. We see something that looks closer to ideal. What happens if we block the airflow across the condenser? We saw not much change in high side, but we see a change in condenser temperature. Now pressure starts to climb. We see our subcooling start to increase. We see our condenser outlet temperature increase which makes sense. Now we start to see a change. We can see the box is starting to become taller and skinnier. We get up to a 414 pound high side. That's the point at which the, syst the control system turns the compressor off. And look at what happened to our subcooling. We went from 13 degrees of subcooling across the condenser all the way up to 50 degrees of subcooling. And look at what our temperature drop across the condenser was. We're at 180 degree condenser inlet, 120 degree condenser outlet. So while we are getting rid of some temperature, we're not getting heat out of the system. We're getting, we still have uh, an elevated temperature because we can't transfer the heat. Remember what I said, pressure comes from heat. 
If we go back to where we started as well, look at our evaporator temperature. It's about 30 degrees. Our evaporator temperature stayed about the same. So in this case, you've, in the short amount of time that this was run, you might not have noticed the performance problem, but we can very clearly see that we have a problem with this system. As we start, as I said, with an airflow problem, the box starts to become skinnier and taller versus shorter and wider. Uh, there's one part of this section that I do want to point out. Uh, I'm going to skip to it. I want to talk about the Prius Prime HVAC system solely because I think this is the neatest HVAC system out there. This is one of my favorite HVAC systems. Um, I think it, it's totally, pardon the pun, it's cool what they're doing with HVAC on a Prius Prime. For those of you that don't know what the Prius Prime is, it is an, a Prius that is plug-in capable as well as having the gas engine. It is 30 mile range on electric before the gas engine kicks in. This is running a true heat pump air conditioning system. That heat pump is capable of creating heat in the passenger compartment, making the passenger compartment comfortable down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperature without running the gas engine. So we're not putting hot coolant through the heater core to make heat. We're making heat with the air conditioning. Because of that, it is a very, very complicated and complex HVAC system. You can see we have six different modes of operation. Three for when we're running with gas engine off. Three for when we're running with gas engine on. We're taking into account we're not only heating, we are also dehumidifying with the heat pump. So let's look at how this system operates in heat mode. Think about what a heat pump is. It's an air conditioner running in reverse. So instead of getting rid of heat at the condenser, we're picking up heat from outside at the condenser and we're moving that heat into the passenger compartment. So if we leave the compressor, call out I is the compressor, we leave the compressor and we go to M. M is called the internal condenser. That is for all intents and purposes, the heater core when we're running the heat pump making heat. So we discharge heat from the refrigerant to the passenger compartment at point M in the internal condenser. We leave, go through a refrigerant line into this whole big dotted line box here is called an accumulator and valve assembly. Uh, it is in the right front fender. Important to note that uh, one service tip, if you ever have a Prius Prime in the shop that you need to recover refrigerant from is that this accumulator assembly that's in the right front fender you have to add external heat to it when you recover refrigerant. Uh, Toyota recommends using a hair dryer to do it. Yes, there is a hair dryer that is now a Toyota required special service tool. We come back into this assembly, we go through D. This is an expansion valve. So think about it. all we're doing here is we have an air conditioner that's running in reverse. Instead of the condenser being out front, the condenser's in the dash and the evaporator core's out front. So we go through an expansion valve. We go into C as an added piece. This is a liquid vapor separator. So anything that is already vapor that is boiled goes back to the compressor from this point. The liquid refrigerant then goes through out to the regular condenser in front of the radiator back through a series of one-way valves into an accumulator assembly to make sure that there is no liquid left 
and back to the compressor as vapor. Again, it's just an air conditioner running in reverse. Instead of discharging heat to outside, we're pulling heat from outside. Now we do have a regular heater core in the box below 14 degrees ambient temperature or when the gas engine is running, we use the heater core for heat instead of the heat pump. And we have a conventional evaporator core. Dehumidification mode, we leave the compressor. In this case, we're running as heat still, so we're discharging heat to the condenser, internal condenser. Here, when we come into the accumulator assembly, we have a split. Some of the refrigerant is going to go to the outside condenser to pick up heat. Some of the refrigerant is going to go through a one-way valve, through the expansion valve for air conditioning, back to the heater core. And we create a refrigerant loop. Oops. like this that creates basically a standard HVAC system with an evaporator core in the dash and a heater core in the dash. So we're discharging heat to the inside, but we're also cooling that air to dehumidify it first. We have a cold evaporator core in addition to a warm internal condenser. Again, we need to pick up that heat somewhere, so we're picking up some heat in the, uh, or, yeah, we're picking up some heat here, and the rest of the heat then, we have a second path that we're going like before, through the expansion valve, through the separator, through the condenser, and back into the accumulator. So we're running two loops to give us, not only we're getting cooling and heating at the same time to dehumidify the air. For refrigeration, then we're still going through the internal condenser because it's plumbed that way. The difference is now there's a temperature door inside the HVAC box that has this internal condenser sealed off. At that point, since we have no airflow through it, we have no heat exchange through it, it's just a piece of pipe, basically. We go through an expansion valve that at this point is wide open, out to the condenser, through this one-way valve, through the expansion valve, through the evaporator core, back through the accumulator. At this point, other than the fact that we're using the internal condenser basically as a pipe, it is a standard HVAC system at this point. So summary, what we hope to accomplish in this class, we wanted to give you guys all of the standards for equipment, for new and old refrigerant, what's there, what your options are when you're buying equipment. I hope that I gave you some good tips on leak detection, what the various different leak detection app methods are good for or well suited for, some techniques to be more efficient and more accurate with our diagnosis and air conditioning. Because the end game is we need to be service ready as this technology starts to come into our, our base so that we are ready for what we see. With that, I'll turn it back over to Bryn. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have a lot of good hey, questions. Guys, let me break in for one second. Um, I wanna let everybody know that we've resolved the book issue. Uh, so I wanna request that the chat stay quiet uh, for a while because what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a new link for you to download the book and you should be able to get it without 
any problem. So I just wanted to put that out there before anybody leaves the class uh, so that they can get the link before they leave. Okay, now y'all can go ahead. Uh, Ken, while you're there, there was a question that you, um, somebody asked about a certificate. There will be yeah, uh, we're going to load the attendances into our into our LMS, and then uh, you'll be able to uh, print a certificate for the class. As of the recommended on performance test, asking if we have outside air and it's humid outside, would that put more strain on the AC performance? That's for you, Tim. Can you re repeat yeah. that question, Bryn? Um, I picked it up. I think so. What he's trying to say is, if we're dealing with a very very humid day, and we're on doing a performance test on outside air versus max air, basically recirc, if that's going to affect system performance. And the answer to that is yes, any change is going to affect system performance, which is why when we are doing the performance test, we need to set the vehicle up the way the manufacturer says. We need to control the variables that we can control, which outside air versus research air is one of the variables that we can control and then adjust for the variables that we can't control like humidity. As you saw in the, uh, let me go back to, Sure, one of the charts here. <laughs> Ken, if you're listening, somebody asked if all the certificates will say Brian Brian Kulata. <laughs> no, the the. If you registered with your name and not somebody else's, it'll have your name on it. <laughs> so if we go back to these, this performance test chart, and again, this is a typical chart that you can use you know, if we are missing a performance test specification. And you can see that humidity is one of the things that we control for. So again, if we are, in this case, over 50% humidity, I mean, in the summer on a hot day, I think almost every part of the country is going to be over 50% humidity. Um, we would use this line. This is going to be what we're shooting for. And this would be our minimum duct temperature. If your humidity is less than that, then obviously we would use one of the other lines of the chart. But the manufacturer's information for doing the performance test uh, should specify this. Yeah, unless you live in the desert southwest, you should be. Yeah, I, mean, I think the desert southwest, or if you're doing a performance test on a very cool, you know, like an early spring day or something, you're going to be on the bottom lines of all of these temperature lines. Right. Uh, from Jason, which temperature sensors will absolutely disable AC function as opposed to those that will limit proper cooling operation? What temperature sensors will eliminate AC function, that is going to depend on what the manufacturer programmed the system, how the manufacturer programmed the system to operate and what its failure mode management is, whether it can work around something or not. One that will almost always disable AC operation is an ambient air temperature sensor um, because we don't want to run the AC on a cold day. You know, If we're in a situation where our ambient temperature is such that we could freeze the evaporator core, we're not going to run the AC. Um, that's probably the number one that is an always disable HVAC, or at least usually disable HVAC. Other than that, it that's something that's gonna be manufacturer dependent. And I would refer you to the uh, description of operations uh, section of the service manual for that particular vehicle. All right, from Nathan, why should actuator learn be something to be avoided? We see a lot of actuator problems with Toyotas these days. And that You brought that up specifically with one case. Yeah, I, I mentioned the avoiding actuator learn. Uh, basically, in my opinion, it's one of those things where you may have a system that's learned to work around something. Not so much that you, know, you do an actuator learn, basically that you don't want to do an actuator learn and create a problem that wasn't there. Uh, basically, then you get to have an awkward conversation with the customer because the vehicle is now doing something that it wasn't doing before. Um, 
that's basically my my opinion doing relearns is kind of like doing a reflash where there's a reason and a time and a place to do it but i wouldn't just go doing it just because we should be doing it when we're directed to in the service manual and following the manufacturer's recommendation you know like i said my example that bryn mentioned was um chrysler's old cool down test where you, you pull disconnect the battery and now i've got to do a cool down test but because there was a problem with the system it's not that i broke something there was already a problem but now i've erased stored values and i've got lights flashing and things like that because i erased stored values so the car was already broken the customer just didn't realize it basically and now we get to have a conversation with the customer because their car is definitely broken now is it possible to have normal static pressure with a low charge is it possible to have normal static pressure with a low charge absolutely <laughs> General rule of thumb is it takes somewhere around three ounces of refrigerant in the system to give you normal static pressure. Uh, if you want to try this out, take a vehicle that you're charging, charge two ounces into it and let it stabilize. Then charge another two ounces into it and let it stabilize and watch how your system pressure comes up. It does not take a whole lot of pre refrigerant in the system to give you static pressure, generally 10 to 15% of the charge. Uh, what do you all think of the enthalpy chart? That was earlier on. I think that was before you kind of covered some of it. Yeah. Um, I, I can take a I, swing. I'm, yeah, I'd say I, I need to gather up what I want to say about that. So if you want to give your Basically, opinion. Basically, and you, you were by far more familiar. My take on it is I think technicians, most technicians working on H, mobile HVAC can get by pretty well um, with just pressure testing. But I think to really be accurate and really know what you're doing, I think you need to start doing temperature tests. Most technicians that are kind of getting by, they usually get their backside handed to them from time to time. You, this is where this stuff, these, these high level diagnostic techniques can come into play. That's kind of a short answer in my take. I think, yeah, Brent is 100% right in that. Um, I do a lot of temperature testing. I don't draw a lot of enthalpy charts. You, know, you start to, when you do a lot of air conditioning, you do a lot of temperature testing, you start to get a feel for what is normal, basically. When I will sit down and draw out the enthalpy chart or let use the man tooth and let it create the enthalpy chart is generally when I've got something that's not making sense. And I find that you know, a lot of us are visual learners and it helps to give you a more full picture of what's going on. Is it a tool that you need for every car that comes in with an AC performance complaint? No but it's a great tool to have in your toolbox when you have something that's just not making sense. I think it could also help you to understand better, you know, once you really start working. It through that. Yeah, it definitely does, you know, understanding what's going on. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of the material that we covered tonight is stuff that would be covered in a college level thermodynamics class for perspective. When I took thermodynamics in college, we spent 16 weeks learning the material for five hours every week. I just gave you a crash course in thermodynamics in an hour. So, you know, we threw a lot at you, but when, if you go back and start to apply it, it starts to really get the full picture of how an air conditioning system is working. And one of the things that I always like to tell my students is if we understand how something is supposed to work, we can figure out why it doesn't. I'm going to ask yeah. you this, but I'm, go ahead. Ken. Oh, Sorry. I was going to, I was going to add one more thing too, that, just like any other advanced diagnostic technique that you're not used to, if you don't practice it, you won't get it. That's so perfect, beautiful even, point, Ken. Even, even if you don't think you need one when you're getting started on it, draw one out anyway. And just compare it with what you find with your pressure and temperature diagnostics with what you see on the empathy chart. And just get accustomed to using it. You know, And the more you use it, the better you'll get. That's a very good point, Ken. Uh, this one I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to take a um, qu quick story to add to it. 
what kind of issues we see in aftermarket condensers were used uh, that were small or less capacity. I heard a story once where a shop owner shared that a rep came in and he was kind of bragging about the fact that this, these aftermarket condensers had less capacity, so you need less refrigerant and it was more efficient and all of this. And um, I thought that was interesting. I think the shop owner asked him, well, do they come with documentation that ex that explained the different capacity and a charged rates that we should be putting in these things? And uh, the, the rep did not have an answer, but go ahead, Tim, if you don't mind. So we did, um, at Max, we did, some extensive research on this for those of anyone that missed the first night i sit on the board of directors of mobile air conditioning society as well and i do a lot of work with the mobile air conditioning society we've experimented with this um the general thing that you find where you have a charge change on a condenser the charge dropping is something where we've gone from either a most likely a six millimeter piccolo style of condenser which is the one where you have round header tubes and then uh, bars that go across to a modern parallel flow condenser as we saw one of the slides from uh the first night and we saw a bunch of condenser cross sections and how much smaller the condenser cross section is one of the things that i said then is the name of the game for heat transfer is surface area so if we can put more surface area in a smaller box we will get that we can get the same heat transfer out of a smaller package with less refrigerant capacity. Um, the problem does become how to properly charge the system. And you wind up charging the system, looking at pressures and temperatures, doing temperature testing while you're charging. Um, we cover the temperature testing part in another course. Uh, I pulled some excerpts out of it for tonight. Uh, the course we cover that with CTI is HVAC 2002. Um, we're doing temperature testing and talking a lot about temperature drops and showing a lot of examples of it. It can be a challenge to figure out what your charge should be in that case. The only time I've ever seen it documented uh, what the charge is was a change at the OEM level. And that was uh, some Chevy Express vans. Uh, the OE service condenser and the Delphi condenser went from a serpentine style to a parallel flow. And uh, GM and Delphi both gave you a new charge label to put on the system. The other thing that I've seen, and I experienced this personally uh, two weeks ago, was I put a condenser on my personal Chevy Suburban, charged it to spec, and the aftermarket condenser was actually bigger than the factory condenser. I wound up putting an extra six ounces of refrigerant in the system until over factory charge spec until it was cooling correctly. And that was doing measuring my temperature drops and measuring my evaporator inlet and outlet temperature because that is an, an orifice tube system until I got the temperatures where they were supposed to be. So yes, it does happen. Yes, it's a pain in the butt. Um, I, without going into and doing four hours of temperature testing, I don't have an answer on how to charge those. I would suggest you, uh, if we're running HVAC 2002 in the area, that would be a good class for you to take to learn about that. Uh, this Robert says he works on a lot of hybrid vehicles with heat pump mixed into the system and how to the figure into, how does that figure into Diag, which uh, I would imagine if he's working on a lot of hybrids with heat pumps, he's probably working Toyota? <laughs> he would almost have to be because at least up to 19 model year, I believe Prime was the only thing that had heat pump. Um, I honestly can't speak from personal experience on that because I have not diagnosed one yet. Um, I actually have not, other than one that we had for testing at max, I haven't seen a Prius Prime in person to uh, be able to comment on that. Um, Put, if you'd like, um, I'll put my email address up at the end. Send me your contact information. I do have some contacts at Toyota. Um, 
I will pass the question along to them and try to see if I can get some information back to you. Um, while we ask some other questions here, D Tim, can you go back to the slide that uh, covers the temperature drop across the condenser? Sure can. Yeah. And then while you're doing that, um, Someone asks about the Mantooth, the difference between 67003 or 67002 compared to, to the 67007. I took a quick look and uh, it was kind of hard to spend a lot of time looking tonight once your question came up. I'm not sure of the difference. Jim, I don't know if you're still with us. I, um, if you know, um, please chime into the chat. Uh, Tim, do you know the difference between those models? I think the difference is one has wireless thermocouples, the other one does not have wireless thermocouples. It may, is it possible that um, maybe one of the models doesn't have both 1234YF versus N134? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I think, I know they came out with a kit that has, that the thermocouples are wireless, so that you don't have to run. Uh, a cable between the thermocouple and the pressure transducer. So I think that is the difference. The other thing that you'll find with some of the part numbers for the Mantooth, they have some kits out that are tailored to some of the OEs that are uh, using that tool as an essential special service tool. So it's okay. possible also that that's an OE kit. I got you. That, that makes sense. I've seen that before. Jim says that they have one with one wireless and one tethered. Uh, he prefers both being wireless. Um, he didn't think that there's a difference. Uh, I guess most kits come with both 134 and 1234. Yeah, I think I'm, I thought that when they came out with it, they said they were going to do everything with both refrigerants. If you want, I, I can turn Jim's mic on and let him chime in yeah jim is definitely the resident expert unmute yourself and go ahead jim there you go can't hear you buddy oh um 1234 YF, is there an app out there that can give me graph of pressure versus temp scale? Uh, Pete, so there's something looking for That's pressure. Thing. You there, Jim? Yeah, I'm here. There you go. Um, without me bouncing on and looking at the specific part numbers, um, be sure that the one you're looking at comes with the with both hose kits to adapt to 1234 and R134. That's the automotive version. Within that, they had one where both of the um, pressure transducers were Bluetooth wireless, and they had another one where one of them made a wireless Bluetooth connection to your tablet or phone and then was tethered to the other unit. And so what I found was working with one that was tethered, sometimes under the hood, I couldn't get my orientations as clean as when I had both units being Bluetooth. And yes, there are supposed to be new offerings where the, the, the thermocouples are also wireless. So you definitely are going to have to have a phone or a tablet that can support multiple devices being connected at the same time. Um, but at a minimum, the two wireless thermocouples um, and the automotive version of the app, you're going to have to select automotive when you set up the app and that's the only way that you get the two main gases we deal with in the enthalpy charts. And that's the answer to that in short. I would definitely agree with Jim with making sure that you've got two wireless pressure transducers. I can, my kit has both wireless pressure transducers, but I agree with Jimmy. And when you think about sometimes how spread across the engine compartment, your uh, pressure uh, service ports can be, I don't think I would want to have to tether one to the other. I can see that being a real, real pain. 
Very cool. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I had a car that disabled the AC system because it had a faulty blend door. Could you explain why it would disable the AC? I would have to refer more to the um, manufacturers, you have the description of operation and trying to see what the failure mode for that particular vehicle is. That's something that comes down to an OEM specific strategy. My thought on it is something if we had a failed blend door, specifically if we had something where the blend door was stuck on full cold, possibly disabling the compressor because we, we if we had the compressor running, we might have some trouble with dehumidification, uh, clearing the windshield if we didn't have heat cycling in. Um, that's the only thing that comes to mind right now without referring to manufacturer specific documentation. Yeah. It's, it's there's like it's, it's trying to understand some fault strategy can be kind of tough sometimes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good good time to bring up that failure strategies are the hardest thing in the world to find in service information. And a lot of times you yep. can't find it. Yeah. The only way it the only way you get it is from experience. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. that's you know that's one of the things that I wish the OEs would tell us is what happens when something, fa you know, when this fails and they just, yep. they don't. So yeah, you get some OEMs that are good at it, like General Motors, you know, you pull up, you pull up a fault code in GM and you have you know, conditions. What happens when this DTC sets? Mm -hmm. Great. So you're telling me how you are managing this failure mode. Yep. I wish every OEM did that. Yeah, I had a similar experience and it was a, maybe a 12 Jeep Grand Cherokee and they, uh, we had a, erratic blower like the blower would uh, either be inoperative or erratic because of a faulty blend door actuator so I've seen it it's uh, unfortunately like Ken said you there's there's little to no documentation most of the time what interesting one since you brought up blend door and Chrysler uh, Chrysler has started putting incorporating blend door position into the thermostat test logic which makes sense because if we're on, if we have the blend door swung to heat, it's going to take longer for the engine to come up to operating temperature. So we're using that as part of the PO128 logic. Because of that, a blend door fault, circuit fault, or a feedback fault can turn the check engine light on on some newer Chrysler products. Nice. Because it's part of the PO128 logic. <laughs> Uh, failing uh, emissions because yeah that that's when I thought that I thought that's going to be a fun one to explain you know uh, Mrs. Johnson your car failed emissions inspection because you have a bad temperature blend door actuator and I have to take the dash out to fix it so new technicians would it be a good idea to use thermal imaging camera for temp rises and drops on each area of the AC system just wanted so, to comment only so one of the things they study with a temp gun, with a thermal imaging camera, as well as with the IR guns, is it can be, you can get heat wash going on. Uh, I wish I would have thought, I didn't think to put it into uh, this presentation. There is a picture of it in one of our other HVAC classes of what I said, where we have air conditioning components near hot engine parts. And what happens, what can happen sometimes especially when you're working on the low side of the system, the parts of the system that are cold, is that you can have such a temperature gradient between the rest of the picture, you know, like the engine components, exhaust components, things like that that are in the picture, and the air conditioning components that you can't really see the air conditioning components in the picture because all the colors that are in your thermal image are temperature gradient. And if the temperature gradient gets so spread out, you start to lose some of the detail. So I prefer direct measurement. One of the tools that I like for direct temperature measurement, uh, it's called the temp scan. Uh, you can get them from a whole bunch of companies, sell them now. I know Four Seasons sells it. Uh, Advance has them available from Four Seasons. The temperature probe on it, it's like, think about like the uh, Magic Fingers pickup tool. So it's about 18 inches long. You press it to open it. And at the very end, there's a thermocouple and a spring clip to hold the temperature 
sensor to the line. So you can snake that into very tight places to measure temperature directly. I prefer that to a thermal imaging camera. What's it called? And I'll type it in chat. It's a temp scan. Okay. Um, let's see. When evacuating a system, is there a drop in the total freon? I would think, I think the next word is supposed to be evacuated on what the actual amount of freon in the system. An older tech told me there's usually a 10% drop. How true is that? I'm not sure that I'm understanding. If I he's saying he, that there's like when you recover the system that there's 10% of the refrigerant is left in the system. I would is think kind of what I think that's what he's, the point that he's getting at. Um, well, what I'll say for, if we go back to um, the first night when we were talking about equipment specifications, one of the specifications for a modern either a J2788 for 134A or a 2843 machine for YF is that in order to be certified, they must recover 95% of the refrigerant within a half of an hour. So we have to get 95% of the refrigerant out. Now, depending on the system, there are some challenges with getting refrigerant out. Yeah, accumulator systems, orifice tube systems, as we start to recover the refrigerant, that accumulator gets really, really cold. And we tend to get some refrigerant that is stuck under oil. So we have to warm it up, add some heat to get all of that refrigerant out. You can get, with modern recovery equipment, you can get almost all of the refrigerant out of the system. With some of the older equipment, the first generations of recovery recycle machines, instead of that specification being 95% uh, in half an hour, I believe they were required to pull the system down to either, I want to say either four or 10 inches of vacuum in a certain amount of time, which didn't then um, adjust for outgassing. And when these, when I say that the performance is specified that they recover a certain amount of refrigerant in a certain amount of time, the vehicle that the systems are, that the AC machines are currently tested on for when they're certified is a Chevy Suburban Orifice tube system with rear air conditioning. That's a three to three and a half pound system with an accumulator and orifice tube, two systems, it is considered one of the hardest systems to recover. So if it can recover that system within a half an hour and recover all of the refrigerant, it's gonna recover almost everything else and recover 99% of the refrigerant. Um, he, he replied, say when you evacuate a system that has a pound and a half, the machine only reads it took 1.35 and went into a vacuum. Here's the deal. I, if you're trying to gauge whether or not a vehicle lost uh, some charge due to a leak by recovering what you put in, that's not a good way to gauge. I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah. If that's what you're referring to, then Britain is 100% right. Just trying to, you know, I would, if I pulled 1.35 pounds first pass out of a uh, pound and a half system, I'm considering that system was a full charge. Nope, I guess that wasn't his point. <laughs> well, um, how does an identifier know if it has air in the system? How does an identifier know if it has air in the system? There are two methods depending on what identifier you have. Um, some older identifiers and some of the economy line identifiers when the identifier is calibrating. So when, when you turn an identifier on, it warms up, then you attach the hose, leave the sample hose, not attached to the vehicle, so just leave it sitting in clean air, and it will pump air through to purge. The older machines would take a sample of the air and see, okay, this is the uh, infrared spectrum of what's pulling through now, so this is air. And then would use that in the calculations once it identified. A modern identifier has an oxygen sensor in it and it's weighing how much of that sample that it takes is air. When I say a modern identifier, I'm gonna go, there are only two companies making refrigerant identifiers. 
in the United States, the only ones that are readily available is Neutronix. Uh, there is one other company that makes refrigerant identifiers. I have never seen one of their identifiers in the wild. I've never seen one of theirs for sale anywhere. On Neutronix, the oxygen sensors got, they switched the oxygen sensor uh, style with the Ultima ID. So anything newer, either an Ultima ID, an Ultima 1234YF or a Legend has the oxygen sensor in it. Um, do you think in the future we're going to move to CO2 systems? In future, do I think we're going to move to CO2 systems? No. I mean, that can't was get, what we were looking at. Right? Unless, they, unless they can get the cost down, there's no way. They have to get the cost down, they have to get the packaging down, and they have to get the efficiency up. So going back to what one of the things we were talking about, the Mercedes case. Mercedes wanted to go to, in addition to some other things in the background, Mercedes wanted to go with CO2, and they pushed that hard. Mercedes and Volkswagen are both currently building vehicles with CO2 air conditioning systems in Europe. On Mercedes, it's available on the S-Class. Uh, Volkswagen, it's available on the Phaeton. The reason being is those are both their most expensive, lowest volume vehicles, so that if it doesn't work, and they have to recall it and do something else, they're not recalling a whole bunch of vehicles. Um, they also have the most profit margin. On the S-Class, the last I heard to go with the CO2 air conditioning system versus a 1234YF system in Europe is about a $4,000 option. The horsepower requirements of these systems are astronomical. I believe it's somewhere around 10 horsepower to run on a CO2 compressor. Not gonna oh, happen. <laughs> an eight cylinder Mercedes, that's nothing. A Civic doesn't have enough horsepower to spare to run this compressor. We also don't have the space needed. I mean, these the evaporators, because of the high operating pressures that we're dealing with, remember we're dealing with operating pressures over 10 times what a, uh, 134A system is, the condensers and the evaporators are huge. So yeah, I, I really am not expecting to see CO2 come into the United States. And like so with the efficiency problem, we start to lose efficiency with CO2 over about 80 degrees ambient. In summertime, that covers most of the United States has daily high temperatures over that. So, you know, I wouldn't personally wouldn't be real happy if I bought a new S class Mercedes spent all the money for it, spent the money for the CO2 air conditioner, and the first hot summer day, my air conditioning doesn't work. Uh, some, some good ones here. How do you know if the system has the correct oil charge? That's a tough one. Sometimes. That is a tough one, and it tends to come back to experience, unfortunately. Um, one way, a down and dirty way, if you recover the system, and you're recovering ounces of oil, you generally should not recover a whole lot of oil when you recover refrigerant. If you recover refrigerant and you're recovering ounces of oil, you probably have an overcharge of oil. Um, yeah, and then undercharges of oil usually come from people replacing parts like accumulators and stuff and not putting the oil in it that the OE recommends yeah. you put in the component. Or an undercharge mm -hmm. of oil generally coming from also a vehicle just being consistently recharged without finding the leak mm -hmm. and fixing the leak. Remember, when refrigerant is leaking, it's generally taking the oil with it. Generally, how you find a vehicle is undercharged on oil is because the compressor seized. You know, I mean, yeah. com complete honesty there is that's generally how you find an undercharge. Um, okay. Uh, Thomas, you're clearly a very experienced HVAC tech. Thanks for the comments and chat and the questions. Really appreciate it. Um, at one point, he mentioned something that was definitely uh, very valuable. Uh, I've seen technicians do this, try to do performance and, and test testing on a AC systems with the hood open and fresh air. Uh, you're going to be bringing a lot of that engine 
you know, temperature right back into the cabin. So um, that can definitely steer you in the wrong way. Uh, it's interesting when that happens. It's kind of funny, but sad at the same time. So it is. And now that is something sometimes you are looking for. As I said, when we're doing temperature testing or setup, we're trying to create a worst case scenario environment. So bringing in some heat from the engine compartment isn't a bad thing. If we are doing performance testing and trying to compare to OEM specifications, that's another place where you know, does the OEM want the hood open so we're picking up engine compartment heat uh, to simulate sun load or does the manufacturer want the hood closed? Yeah, that's a good point. I was mostly referring to a tech that's trying to figure out why legitimate, you know, why why their system's not performing and they've got the hood open yeah. and just not thinking about it. Yep. Now, go back to the, the question that Kelly was asking about the machines. Uh, one thing you need to keep in mind, if that system's been running for three years and not been serviced, uh, I can't think of a single compressor that doesn't have a built-in leak at the front seal. Okay, and it's going to lose a little bit of refrigerant over time. So that could explain it. It could also be an indicator that your scale or your flow may not flow measurement may not be correct on the machine. Might need to be calibrated. Um, so just now, things like that. Now something going along with what Ken said about that you know front seal leaking yes your front seals do leak when the compressor is operating they have to um, if you go on uh, minnesota department of environmental quality's website they have a list minnesota requires every manufacturer that sells a vehicle in the state of minnesota to supply them with documentation of how much that system leaks when it was new off the assembly line and the, what will be listed is what the manufacturer considers acceptable leakage for that system. So, and it will be listed in grams per year, basically. Uh, a shaft seal leak, current generations of compressors, a shaft seal leak is designed to be less than two grams per year of refrigerant leak. Um, so is there a phone app for 1234 temp to pressure correlation just looking for any of ones you guys have seen you know flat rate techs look for this um, as far as a phone app i do not know uh, the data sheets and pressure temperature charts are available from on refrigerant manufacturers websites so for 1234 yf i know camores has them on their website they have the enthalpy charts available as well and uh, honeywell also has them available so it might work for you. Find it on the refrigerant manufacturer's website, print it out, hang it on your toolbox. Uh, Thomas does add one more note here. Um, and basically, I think what his point is, is we, I think most of us are aware, uh, a lot of own, vehicle owners are trying to fix their own AC system. So just uh, keep in mind, you know, they, they may have tried to fix it with 16 cans with sealer in it and, you know, God knows what else. So, but yeah. uh, that's, that yeah. is definitely the, the problem. Oh yeah. I, I once watched a parts store employee and it wasn't advanced or car quest, but a parts store employee help a customer pour four cans of stop leak in his radiator. <laughs> so anything can happen. My, uh, my best one along those lines, and I was going to work it into uh, one of the slides that I skipped just so we were running out of time. I had a uh, Jeep Wrangler, late 90s, early 2000s. Those systems hold 20 ounces of refrigerant, pound and a quarter. The girl worked part-time at a parts store that is a competitor to CarQuest and Advanced Auto Parts. Uh, her air conditioning quit working. So one of her coworkers said, oh, it needs a compressor. Yeah, if the air doesn't work, it needs a compressor. So I'll put a compressor on it for you. Yeah. Put a compressor on it. Charged it. He put three cans of refrigerant with stop leak in this system. So three cans of 134A with stop leak is what, 42 ounces of refrigerant in a system that holds 20? Did not evacuate the system. So the sealer started hardened, was activated by the moisture that was in the system from it not being evacuated. 
completely blocked the discharge line solid. It was bad enough. As soon as the compressor engaged, the compressor went into high pressure lockup and blew the pop off valve before the high pressure cutout could kill the compressor. Hey, Tim, just real quick, I did make, you made note you were going to add your email. So if you don't mind, just throw that in the chat real quick. Let me uh, pull the chat up here. Uh, I just lost my meeting controls. I think we're done. Yep, we're done.